you're a business associate. You get a BAA, and you get a BAA, and you get a <laughs> Go ahead, Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> you're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax. HIPAA help is on the way. This is Nalia from Georgia Spine and Orthopedic and Talker, and you're listening to Help Me With HIPAA podcast. Thank you for that intro. I'm David Sims of Security First IT and HIPAA for MSPs. And joining me is Donna Grindle of Carden. Good morning, Donna Grindle of Carden. <laughs> uh, good morning. You know I'm not a morning person. I don't know why we do all this in the morning. Because we're all so <laughs> busy at night. And there's no good time. Yeah. Well, we'd probably do it in the morning because if our brains were firing on all cylinders... Most people couldn't keep up with the rabbit holes. <laughs> oh, my God. You know, you're right. <laughs> uh, um, Boeing would be driving us crazy for those, too. Could you cut that out? Could you cut that out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is true. Right. This is true. So uh, today we are going to dive into uh, kind of a listener question, but it's interesting because, you know, when we got this question, we were like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a listener wrote in, and they 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 asked uh, if we could do an episode about uh, who is a business associate. And so, you know, you and I are both like, I'm pretty sure we've done that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so you start go back and you go back into the you know the way back machine, and you find out <laughs> that we did do that. However, <laughs> it was in episode two. <laughs> I was like, wow, it's been that long. You know, back in 2015, we talked about this. <laughs> so, mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure we've touched on it along the way, but to have an episode that's about nothing but this, I couldn't find anything since episode two. And you and I both were certain we had talked about it several times. So I know. So, you know, when we got new listeners coming in and they're starting it, you know, whatever episode 200 and something. They may not go back to episode two. So <laughs> I don't know that I want you to go back to episode two. I know they were very different. Yeah, not just that, but um, there could be some different things that have, you know, come out uh, on certain topics because you know OCR releases guidance and things along the way, and so it's you know it's a good idea to to refresh things from time to time. Indeed. So that is our topic for today. We're going to be talking about who is a business associate, and as strange as things may seem. This question still confuses a lot of people. Well, it can get complicated. Yeah. And we're going to touch on some of that complication in a little bit. We are. But before we do that, you have anything coming up you're going to be speaking at? I think by the time this comes out that the TASCA, TASCA event, the Tennessee Ambulatory Surgery Center Association event in Memphis on September 26th, I will be... Providing the morning entertainment about cybersecurity and ransomware. Cool. Yeah, uh, that that's uh, it's always fun to do the morning. <laughs> Just yeah. give me some coffee, ramp it up, prop me up, wind me up, off we go. So, yep, that's what I'm doing then. I got some other stuff. I'm going to be in Chicago doing some stuff, and um, and uh, there's uh, several things in the southeast. But uh, they're all client things. So, yeah. Somebody sent me a thing and said, uh, "Are you available any Wednesday or Thursday in October?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, you know what? Just two hours ago, I booked four lunch and learns because I'm doing another session with Format Approved that is um, at the end of October, like 23rd and 24th, and 30th and 31st." So that booked, you know, four, and then, you know, it's like, I'm available on this day and this day. So it's just getting packed. I got to find new ways to manage me. <laughs> Good luck with that. Because <laughs> I hadn't figured out how to manage you yet. <laughs> no, no one else has either. Darn the luck. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, hard to do. But, mm -hmm. but as far as the speaking goes, I mean, would you prefer speaking first thing in the morning, right after lunch? Or the end of the day. <laughs> Those are usually the spots they put me. First thing in the morning, right after lunch <laughs> or the end of the day. And 
and people are like, why are you putting HIPAA first? <laughs> yeah, you should put security first. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and then they, you know, or right after lunch, they're like, good, I'll get a nap in. Yeah. End of the day, they skip it. So I don't like the end of the day because, you know, I, I, when they're like, we want you to like be last, so we try to get everybody to stay. Really? Try? <laughs> no. no. You know, unless I start doing bourbon and breeches, as my brother came up with that, I thought it was brilliant. Uh, uh, I like that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, first thing in the morning, right after lunch, I'm fine with either one. You know, usually I'll do these luncheon seminars and stuff, and, you know, we get to eat a little bit, and then they call me up to speak, and I always look at the person next to me. How are my teeth? <laughs> Got anything in my teeth? And it starts with, you know, they're looking at me like, who are you? So there's the answer. <laughs> yeah. No uh, no real good place to be, but definitely not at the end of the day. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's and when you go after somebody else, it's uh, you never know what you're going to get either. You know, one time I had to go after a comedian. <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Throws, throws all my jokes out the window. Yeah, I, I was like, well, you know, it, that was better than when I followed uh, <laughs> the other guy in healthcare. The one no. I, the one uh, I'd be named. Well, then, yeah, <laughs> then the guy that just kept calling me the previous speaker. <laughs> but then there's the time that I had to stand up and talk about HIPAA after a review of new technology for vaginal rejuvenation. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> that's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, you know, well, they're talking about two very different things, and so. Well, you're talking about uh, risk management rejuvenation. <laughs> <laughs> so it's always challenging in healthcare. You never know what you're going to get. <sighs> yeah. All right, you ready to dive into today's topic? Yes. All right. Well, we'll do that right after the break. Cybercrime is a multi-billion-dollar industry and growing. How confident are you that your computer network can withstand a cyber attack? Can you afford to take the chance that what you have today will protect you? Call us and find out if the cybersecurity in your business is something you should be concerned about or if you can rest easy knowing your business is protected. Visit us online at securityfirstit.com. That's securityfirstit.com. And schedule a time to talk. Did you know that 83% of healthcare organizations report a strong negative impact to their bottom line after a data breach? So many doctors think that they're HIPAA compliant and have nothing to worry about. Many of those organizations thought the same thing before it happened to them. Call Cardin today at 678-292-5001 so they can assess your practice and help ensure you are protected and prepared. Visit CardinHQ.com to learn more. All right, let's get into this. So the first question is, who is a business associate? How, how do we figure that out, Donna? <laughs> because, you know, they don't know who they are, right? <laughs> because they're going, look, I'm not going to be a business associate. I am not doing this HIPAA stuff, but I'll do no. your work. <laughs> I'm going to do the work. Well, that's why I want to go first into the one that drives us both insane. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and when I was writing the notes, I was just, you know, I knew that this is so frustrating for us. The number of times people will come up and they'll say, you know, XYZ vendor says they are not a BA and they're not going to sign a BAA. Mm hmm. A lot. Yeah. And then in my notes, I say insert rant here because. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can get so frustrated over this one. But the thing is, is that that theory of if I don't sign this, then I'm not a business associate is totally wrong. I mean, it doesn't work. It doesn't protect anybody. In fact, it makes things worse mm -hmm. because they've made it clear the work you do makes you a business associate. The business associate agreement just formalizes what your responsibilities are and acknowledges them. Yeah. And so you are still a business associate, even if you never sign a BAA. Mm -hmm. If the work you do makes you one, all it means when you don't sign one is that you are actively involved in willful neglect, really, is, you know, 
And every day that you're doing work for your clients, both of you have two violations. It's an improper disclosure. You know, you're knowingly taking this data without an agreement and you're doing the work without an agreement. So there you go. I always love the people that when you get into that, you, and you explain everything you just did and they look at you and go, well, yeah, but that's your opinion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, because HIPAA is like up for interpretation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then you can even pull up the part that says the work you do makes you a BA <laughs> and show it to them. You know, uh-huh. I can show you where this says this, you know. Yeah, but that's just your opinion. <laughs> I know, and I had one guy that was just sending me these rants in email because I was telling him he was a BA, <laughs> and he's telling me he's not. And I'm like, okay, you know, that, that, and, you know, it was one of those uh, where they were interpreting what the law said and trying to find a loophole that really wasn't there, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm like, you know, that's your business decision. But if my clients ask me about you, I'm going to tell them they're your BA. <laughs> you know, it, it really doesn't. You don't you didn't hire me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, clearly you didn't or I would have made you be a BA. So, uh, you know, but it's like they're determined to make me give in and say that they're not one. And I'm like, you know what? No, I can't. And it really doesn't matter to me what you think. It's your business decision. And you have your lawyers and you do your thing. But I get paid to advise. And I am advising my people, look, this is what the law actually says. Here, read it. (laughs) And, uh, you know, it's pretty clear sentences. And, uh, you know, and I do this all day, every day. I'm pretty sure that, you're not doing it all day, every day. So, yeah. So first and foremost, it doesn't matter. Right. So how do we define who really is a business associate? What, what factors are involved in understanding if you are a business associate or not? <laughs> I don't know. Another point you're a business t- associate. You get a BAA <laughs> and you get a BAA and you get- <laughs> Go ahead, Oprah. <laughs> Just uh, what is it? Uh, just send everybody a business associate agreement. And that way, you know you hit the right ones. <laughs> yeah, and and that is wrong too, because people that are signing a business associate agreement when they have no business doing it, it's even worse. Because now, <laughs> you know, I got an office supply company that all they do is, uh, you know, deliver paper and stuff, and they've signed a business associate agreement, and that. No, <laughs> you know, uh, the, and then you get uh, uh, all of these tiny little companies. And so clearly they're not reading it, you know, and somebody's, uh, you know, you, all, you always get that phrase. Oh, it's what you have to sign to do work in healthcare. Yeah. Uh, it's just a paperwork. Uh, <laughs> it's just a formality. <laughs> and another thing is the, that you can be a business associate and never work for a covered entity. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that people miss. So here's the thing. If you work, you provide services to a covered entity or another business associate, and the work that you do requires you to have persistent access to PHI in order to do that job. So you're falling under the create, receive, maintain, or transmit list that we talk about if you're involved in any of that. So do we need to get into what persistent access is? (laughs) Well, I'll just let you get into it because I always, you know, get into it and get, you know. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it is what it says it is, right? It's, you have the ability at any time to access that data. Doesn't mean that you do access it, that you have the ability to access it. And it doesn't mean that you can see the actual data either, uh, MSPs. Mm -hmm. It means that you have access to the data. So if I wanted to go in and delete the data, then now I have access to it, right? (laughs) Because I couldn't have deleted it if I didn't have access. (laughs) 
Yeah, I mean, a simple way to do it is if you were doing your job, would I be able to uh, classify it as a data breach? If the answer is yes, you're a business associate. Yeah, it's a pretty easy way to do it. Yeah. So, you know, the if you're involved in creation, receiving, maintaining, which includes managing the devices and the network. Right. Not just maintaining the data. Right. And transmitting, which, again, network, then you're involved in the work you do requires you to be able to see and potentially impact the confidentiality, integrity, or availability, the CIA. Mm -hmm. So here is what we always say. If you cremate PHI for a CE or a BA, then you are a BA and responsible for the CIA of all the PHI you have access to in order to do your job. There you go. Oh. Yeah. Easy peasy. <laughs> <laughs> I understood every bit of that. There you go. So create, mm. receive, maintain, and transmit. Mm -hmm. is cremate to me. Yeah. And then CIA is easy. Confidentiality, integrity, availability. Yeah. And PHI is protected health information, yeah. not patient health information, because not all patient health information is protected, protected. health information. Okay. But I won't yes. go into that because that'll muddy the waters for some people. So let's move on to what kind of vendors could be business associates. Yeah, there's that, that there. This is where it gets fun, right? Yeah, there's the obvious ones, or at least it's obvious to us. <laughs> yeah. Your IT support or managed service provider. Yeah. And we could spend a lot of time talking about that because there's, they're still in denial about whether or not they are or are not. And what their responsibilities are, even if they accept that they are. Yes. Um, you know, I'm in IT forums a lot, and there's all the time. Arguments about, are you a business associate? And if you are a business associate, I still hear the, just sign the paperwork or just follow the NIST CSF is all you have to do. Uh, just do best in class security or, I mean, just there's all this misinformation about what they actually have to do. It drives me nuts. <laughs> have you started yet posting the, the, the BA liability list? On some of those forums? Uh, I posted the uh, episode we did on it. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like normal, as soon as I start posting, the entire thread stops. Yeah. So you never really know <laughs> what we got from it. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So know that up front that many IT providers think they understand what is required from HIPAA, and we can tell you that they are misinformed because we hear it all the time from them. Yeah. It's one of the reasons David does HIPAA for MSPs is to educate. Yeah. Yeah. I would, I mean, there are certainly those out there who do know, uh, but it is, it is a small percentage. Yeah. To truly understand it, it's yeah. often, you know, the number of people I've had people yelling at me, IT company owners yelling at me that I've done thousands of these risk analysis. You don't have to tell me how it works. Um, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the common thing nowadays in in the IT field is they outsource uh, as much of that as they can. The problem with that is they're also outsourcing the knowledge part of it. So they like they don't understand it enough to even know what they should and shouldn't outsource. Right. <laughs> and so to me, that's a problem because if I'm doing work in my business and I'm selling that is I understand what I'm doing, but yet I'm really outsourcing it. That's a problem. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and uh, I mean, we just picked up a new client and uh, there, the call that I got was, you know, we've been using one of these tools and uh, you know, we know most of them and, and I'm using this tool and all it does is ask me a few questions and then it prompts me to fill in my name, download a policy and procedure and upload it to answer the question. And it seems to me that that's not really doing security. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> and, and, you know, the more I look at this, the more I feel like that this, this, I'm not really doing what I'm supposed to do. So, well, you're doing the bare minimum to check the box. 
Mm -hmm. know, and that's your choice in a business as you decide. You know, ours is a different approach. Ours is an approach that says, let's focus on privacy and security and use compliance to prove we're doing what we should be. Mm -hmm. Not let's focus on compliance and nothing else. Right. So, anyhow, so that, uh, there goes a rabbit hole. <laughs> well, the, the reason why we spend a lot of time on MSPs and IT is that because they have the keys to the kingdom, they are so instrumental in making sure that you're following certain aspects when it comes to the security rule. They're, they're, uh, they're more important than your shredding company and things like that. So, yeah, they're probably the most important business associate to any organization that doesn't have their own internal IT. Absolutely. I mean, even outside of uh, HIPAA and, and all that, the IT, the outsourced IT is, is the most important. You should, yeah. you should vet them even if it doesn't apply to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we're going to get into that. So you got things like shredding companies, and we actually had a shredding company say that because we shred on site, we are not a business associate, so. Oh, interesting. Yeah. But anyway, uh, dealing with that. Uh, billing companies who, you know, do coding and billing for you, revenue cycle management, all that kind of stuff. You're clearly giving them the data in order to process the payments. Translation companies where you have, uh, you know, people that speak different languages and you call up the translation company and say, can you send somebody over that speaks blah? And uh, <laughs> yeah, I think sometimes yeah. I speak black. <laughs> yeah, we mostly do. Transcription companies. Let me tell you something. That's that's the scary one right there. Mm -hmm. Yep, 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 yep. And there's so many stories that we have there. But those those are pretty clear cut. You know that you are giving them patient data. You're handing it over in those cases. Mm -hmm. And you know the MSPs who literally look at you and say, "We don't have access to the EHR." You have access to the entire database. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, then you get into the details where it gets down to the relationship and the business service and the data involved. So they may or may not be. It depends. For example, accounting firms. If you have accounting firms and they're writing patient refund checks for you and managing some of your, you know, evaluating your uh, accounts receivable and and dealing directly with patient balances, then they're a business associate. But many accounting firms won't do that on purpose. That's not the service they provide, and they are not a business associate. You're what? Yeah, I was agreeing with yeah. you. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> then you have law firms, and law firms can get complicated because mm -hmm. if you're not representing a covered entity or a business associate in a matter directly related to a patient, then you're not a business associate. Yeah. This is kind of a, another area where PHI can be protected or not be protected, depending on where it's mm -hmm. coming from. And going to. Right. Because if the lawyer represents a patient in a case with a opposing a BA or a CE, that lawyer is not a business associate. So law firms, it can get complicated. Uh, collection companies uh, kind of fall in with the billing companies. So I got kind of got that one on my list wrong. But software vendors. And when you look at your EHR vendor, they're going to be involved in that PHI. And they're, you know, they're going to be a business associate unless they sell you the software and then never talk to you again. Mm hmm um, you know, you look at software vendors like what's a, what's one that everybody has, you know, um, Adobe Acrobat. I hate it, but that software vendor is not a business associate. Right. So and uh, then you have cloud services, which <laughs> this one we went round and round with, you know, when high tech really came out. Mm -hmm. We're not. We don't have blah, blah, blah. So we've got multiple rounds of announcements from OCR making it clear that cloud services do indeed fall under a business associate if they have persistent access to PHI. So if I'm storing an encrypted file there, you're still one because your responsibility, you're responsible for the con uh, 
confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Well, if you don't try to break into it and get to the confidentiality, but you aren't making sure that the integrity and the availability is fine, you know, those are your responsibilities. Yeah. And when you talk about cloud services, some people don't realize uh, what that entails. So, you know, if you're backing up your data somewhere, like, I mean, you can list a million different places, but that's a cloud service. And one that often gets overlooked is like your voice over IP provider. Oh, yes. So they are, you know, typically a cloud service as well. And then you have to, you know, determine whether or not they're a business associate. Mm -hmm. And there are... In the boot camp, we do a session on it where I take you through scenarios to figure out who is a BA and who's not a BA and even get it down to, well, this one may be one, this one may not. And we have a a pretty great discussion every single time as people start to realize how you have to understand what the business relationship is. Mm -hmm. To be AA or not to be AA? (laughs) That is the question. And there's some cases we run into where it's like research, you know, uh, particularly Mm -hmm. where they need data and they can't use de-identified data, but they don't need full PHI either. And so that falls under what's called a limited data set. And there you're not necessarily a BA, but you fall under a data use agreement. So there's kind of like a partial one when you need a chunk of data to do research. So there's all these different scenarios. And for people to think, well, I'm just going to have everybody sign one or it's only two or three, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's something where you have to evaluate what service is being provided, what data is involved, and how the business relationship is structured. So a lot to consider. (laughs) Yeah. So, So what do you do? If your vendor says that they're not a business associate, then you think they might be. You scream really loud. (laughs) You send them this episode. (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) Well, one of the things I did because it became like a constant problem is I added to our website some wizards. that They just ask you a few questions. And based on the answers to your questions, it tells you whether or not you're a covered entity a business associate, and then it even lets you answer the question from, is my vendor a business associate? So you could do it if you're trying to figure it out. And we have all those wizards at cardinhq.com. Under our resources, we have a bunch of stuff. And we have a brand new website, so go check it out. Yes. It's pretty. (laughs) The bottom line is you are put into a position if you believe that they are a business associate and they believe they are not. Mm -hmm. You might have to make a business decision. (laughs) Yeah. And you really, you really have, you know, a few choices. You can talk them into it, get them to do what's right. You can find another vendor. Uh, And in cases where you don't have a choice, you're in an area and this is the only vendor you can use and they're insisting they're not a business associate, you can report them to HHS who will then contact them and they'll make the final decision because they're the ones that get to decide anyway. Mm -hmm. And they will, you know, try to deal with it. So, or you could, you know, get me and David to come in and. (laughs) Yeah, we'll do a song and dance for them. Yeah, there you go. But you go through the process and you finally get them to agree to it. They sign a BAA. They claim they're going to do this. You better vet them. Mm -hmm. Don't take their word for it because let me tell you something. The number of people that said, fine, I'll sign it. And then we sent them a questionnaire and they said the whole thing was not applicable. (laughs) You're wanting too much information. Yeah, we signed this because you made me. Not because we actually intend to do it. Yeah. Heard that one. Yeah. So, you it, you know, if your process and your business decision is you're going to focus on check the box compliance, you're going to do, you know, I, I'm going to make sure I have the business associate agreement because I'm supposed to check and you don't worry about it. You know, at, at least make sure they're doing check the box compliance. I think that there's a misconception when we start talking about you know minimum necessary. Yeah. 
we're talking about uses and disclosures, not your HIPAA compliance program. <laughs> yes. Minimum <laughs> necessary data. Not your, yeah. But again, it's your business decision. And if that's what you're doing and, and your BA signs it, but then they do nothing, they don't even do check the box, they're going to get you, you're going to be tanked by them. Mm-hmm. You know, so you want to make sure they're at least doing that. But if you're like, you know, us where you're going to, you know, take privacy and security seriously, then you work really hard and you're making sure your staff's trained and your policies and procedures and you're doing all your stuff. And then you have a BA who's slacking off. It'll make all your work for nothing. Yeah. And I don't know that people understand all the time how that connection's made. Like I think they assume that if the business associate screws up, then it's on them. And I don't think they realize that it's not really always on them <laughs> yeah there it, it it is a contagious disease that does come back to haunt you so the, the american medical collections associate amca breach mm-hmm. <laughs> that one continues to unfold and it is going to be we we'll, we I keep waiting to figure out when to do an episode on it, but it keeps getting worse. <laughs> I know. If we do one now, we'll have to do another one to update it. Yeah. I mean, it may be multiple ones. And and so this 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 thing is massive, and it's getting worse every day. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're talking really, really bad. This could change everything. It's so bad. Yeah. And I knew it was giant because the very first announcement came from Quest Diagnostics. And they said 12 million patients were involved in this AMCA group, our business associate, that in the Quest case, they hired a company for revenue cycle management who hired an AMCA. So it's two down from Quest. Mm -hmm. LabCorp hired them direct, and so did a lot of these other groups. But if you're not even ever dealing with them, this this is another reason to make that sure that business associate between you and them is doing their job. And I went and looked right away. I was like, who, what's, what's this business associate? And so the description of the breach is that hackers got into their system and literally wandered around and accessed data and exfiltrated data for eight months. Mm-hmm. Eight months. So I go to their website right away after Quest, and, you know, it says – that what does it say on their on their website? First of all, it says that they they've been in business for over thirty years, and you know so many people will tell you we've been in business all this time, so that means we know HIPAA. <sighs> okay, so there is uh, the statement that I saw that made me think this is going to be really really bad. The minute I saw the Quest one, we are one of the nation's top agencies managing over one billion dollars mm-hmm. in annual receivables for a very diverse client base. Mm-hmm. Well, there's no way that 12 million patients from Quest generated $1 billion. No. And I think as of the 22nd, which is, you know, as we recorded last week, they, the number I believe is up to about 25 million reached patient records and climbing. Oh yeah. It, it's, it's, probably way more it's way more than that eight more came out this week yeah Mm -hmm. so they're still trickling out all the ones that uh are their clients we don't know but amca is filing for bankruptcy (laughs) yeah chapter 11 to reorganize and all this stuff and you know i mean it was it was bad if they're in the system for eight months pulling out data i yeah, you know, and we've talked before about, you know, if if somebody's in your system for eight minutes, the amount of damage can be done. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, eight months is like. <laughs> yeah, they, they own you. You should put them on payroll. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm really hoping that at some point we can learn about the the technical parts of that invasion, you know, the infiltration, because we can get valuable training if they will tell us. What happened and how it happened? Oh, we need to tell Jack about this one. Yeah, here you go. All right, we're we're going to tell Jack about this one. But anyway, the thing that you have to do is, uh, 
you know, no matter how small you may think your business associate is, their failure can just destroy you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And yeah. So, you know, we send out a questionnaire when, especially the high risk ones, you want to ask them the same questions or similar questions every single year because you don't know what changed. The person that was doing a great job could get a new job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but, uh, you know, I can assure you the number of those vetting questionnaires has been rising steadily. And in fact, we did an episode after I sat in on uh, the HIPAA summit about, you know, vendor vetting is getting huge. And when somebody said they had 200 questions on their vetting thing, I'm like, oh, my God, you know. So you need to – you're about to get hit with a tsunami of those things if you're a business associate because they're going to start really buckling down. And I don't care what size the business is. You need to be looking at them. Mm -hmm. So ask them the questions. And basically all you're asking them is the contract says you're doing this. Are you doing it? Yeah. There you go. It's not that hard. No. But you you do want to make sure that, especially if you kind of come up with your own questions, you've got to – You've also got to ask the questions in a way that you you know that they're doing what they say they're doing. Otherwise, they're just going to say, yeah, sure, we're doing that. Yeah. You know, we, that's where we learn to do things like, when was your last risk analysis? And they tell you. Then you say, if your last risk analysis was within the last six months, when was the one prior to that? Mm -hmm. Because often... They do one, the number of times that they did one is we did it last month. <laughs> We're doing it as we thought this form. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the policies and procedures, yeah, we, we just downloaded them. So it, it is very important to ask those questions and pay attention to the answers. Mm -hmm. It is. Yes, indeed. So then we get to, well, if everything is about vetting what is in the contract, what do you worry about in your BAAs, your business associate agreement, are key to you being able to vet them in a lot of ways, too. Yeah. And I still see uh, the vendors themselves coming to the covered entities with their own business associate agreement because the covered entity doesn't have one. Well, and you know, the as a business associate, it is very, very hard to manage. Mm-hmm. You know, this is one of the things when we talked about uh, FI flow, PHI flow in a couple of episodes ago. Mm -hmm. Is It's so hard to keep up with what uh, what uh, the conditions in all the different contracts. So it's easier if I have, you know, I know what my conditions are and we use mine if I'm a big vendor. Right. And the bigger the vendor, the less likelihood it is to get it changed. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you got it changed. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes if you just ask, and if it's not too crazy, I think in mine it was yeah. more of a, you know, you probably should be changing this for everybody because <laughs> this is not going to fly yeah. eventually. It's pretty vague. Yeah, yeah. So uh, here, here, now, uh, we as we always have to say, we are not offering legal advice. Yeah, you should consult your attorney on contract matters. If you don't have an attorney, we can point you to one. <laughs> I know we know a few. But it is important that you understand on your own certain things to look for in these contracts and to know, you know, when I look at one and I know, you know, sometimes they're awful. You know, they just say two or three things, mm -hmm. you know, they slap it together. It doesn't even meet all the minimum requirements of a BAA. And and those are really bad. I've I've even seen the BAAs where it's got all these paragraphs that says optional. It's like they didn't even go through to pick which ones they wanted to right. use. It just yeah. you know, there's 15 of them that say optional. I'm like you're what, yeah, supposed so, to leave those in there. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to decide if you're keeping them. <laughs> you know, and so if you're using a template, actually read it and clean it up. <laughs> and I'm not signing that. <laughs> you know, if all the conditions are optional, woohoo. But here, here are some of my pet peeves that uh, a huge pet peeve is if the contract is between two business associates, then it should freaking say it's between two business associates. <laughs> hmm. 
Because you're doing a legal binding contract here, and if you use a contract that I'm doing an agreement as a business associate with David, who's a business associate, and it says that one of us is a covered entity, and the covered entity definition is in the HIPAA law, right away, you could argue that contract's not valid because it's not true. Mm-hmm. You know, and you could break that thing down quickly. And you shouldn't be using the same contract for every single thing, you know, because uh, the contract I have with a MSP needs to be a lot more specific and strict than the contract I might have with maybe uh, my accounting firm who only writes patient refund checks, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's, it should vary, but that's what I expect to see. And then my favorite one is there was always a clause in the agreement that said, if you, my downstream business associate, and we say downstream and upstream, so whoever has the, the direction that the original covered entity, because somewhere there's a covered entity in this uh, chain of command, those are the upstream ones, and the downstream ones are the ones that contract with all the BAs, you know, that are subcontracting down below them. Mm-hmm. And so if it's it's built into the contract that says if you're not meeting your obligations as a business associate that's defined in this contract, then I can get out of all of our contracts because I have to practice data first and foremost. And I don't think a lot of people understand that's in there first. Mm-hmm. And now I'm seeing people also added in there that the downstream, I can get out of it if you're not doing your job because I don't want to be brought down by you. Right. And there are plenty of MSPs that understand their business associate and are concerned because they continue to attempt to get people to do the right thing and and meet those obligations, and they just refuse to do it. And they feel they're going to be left, you know, they'll be thrown under the bus, which we both know is probably true. Yep. So I want to make sure now that the agreement says, you know what, in both directions, if you don't hold up your end of the bargain, all contracts are off. And then indemnification. Oh, this is my favorite. <laughs> well, why? why is it your favorite, huh? Uh, because you know we're starting to see these. We talked. We talked about this a long time ago, where we're starting to see the indemnification put back on the business associate. The problem with that is they're probably getting these templates, and it says something to the effect of, "If there is a breach, the business associate will pay for it." And I'm like, <laughs> uh, "No, <laughs> no, I am not signing this piece of crap <laughs> business associate agreement. I will certainly pay for." a breach that I am responsible for, but I am not paying for any breach that your organization has. <laughs> I know. And they just, oh, geez. <laughs> you know, and, and this, this stuff matters and people act like it doesn't. You know, you go back, reference AMCA. Who you think's paying for all that? Yeah. And so you've got that indemnification, and and in that indemnification, it'll just say you're going to pay for it. It doesn't say what you're going to pay for. Yeah, you're going to pay for it. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Define what that is. In some of them, it says you have to carry a certain amount of cyber coverage. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, if I say you have to carry $3 million in cyber coverage, and you say, yep, I got it, but then... I don't know, let's say you've got 25 or 30 clients with your billion dollars that you've billed, that's 25 or 30 clients maybe, and each of them have now required you to have $3 million. They're all thinking they're going to get the $3 million. Mm, right, and it's split between them. Yeah, and, and that, that goes away quickly. So if you really want to make sure, then you put in there that, there And there are clauses that you can put in that say, hey, I get to go to the front of the line, or you can require a separate policy. You know, there's a lot of things that people are doing now. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But just to say, you know, my business associate is going to pay for it if there's a breach. 
And honestly, even if it says my business associate will pay for it if they cause it, you still may want to spell out what that means. Mm-hmm. What are they paying for? Yeah, very specifically. You know, the the legal cost involved if you're sued, does it involve just the notification cost? Because those are not cheap. People don't realize how expensive it is I, to mail out 12 million letters. Yeah, well, I had one uh, that somebody gave me, and, and it wasn't for me. It was one somebody wanted me to look at. But it, it said that the business associate would be responsible for the notification costs. I'm like, okay. And then the next line, or actually the previous line said, the business associate will be responsible for the notification. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the company that caused the problem is what you're going to then hand all the rest of the information over to so they can also make the notification. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, the, some of the better ones I've seen will actually say, that you are responsible for participating and managing the the data breach. Essentially, it's it, you know it's all legalese, mm-hmm. but essentially you're responsible for participating. But I get to direct you mm-hmm. and tell you what to do. So I am the boss of you. <laughs> <laughs> I get to tell you all those things. So it, it's definitely getting very specific in these contracts. And if you're like if you're a business associate, you should have at least three different contracts. Oh, yeah. At least three different standard contracts. And uh, covered entities, you may even have two, maybe three yourself, some for high risk, some for medium risk, some for low risk. And then in cases like one of the things that comes up a lot is, you know, janitorial services, cleaning services are not considered a business associate. Well, that being said, I would still make sure they have an agreement that says they understand that they are uh, in an environment with confidential data and they have responsibility to make sure their people are doing the right thing. Yeah, because they will grab the wrong box and throw it away sometimes. You know, or you imagine these unlocked shredder bins, how easy it is to walk by every day and stick your hand in there and grab a handful of paper and put it in your pocket. Yeah. And you don't know what you're getting every day. It's totally random. So it'd be really hard to track it back to you. Uh, So, I mean, I'm telling you, don't assume. We know what assume does. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And then, uh, so all of this stuff, another thing, pay attention to the breach notification time frame. (laughs) Because, you know, you'll notify us in a reasonable manner. Who gets to decide? Yeah. What's reasonable? (laughs) Yeah. And you'll notify us of a successful security incident, but a lot of people never notify unless it is a breach. Mm -hmm. But technically, your contract says, even if it's not a breach and you have an incident, you're supposed to notify me. But it doesn't say when or how often. Right. So, you know, I don't want to see the pings and the scans and all of that other stuff that's in there. I want you to stipulate that you know that happens all the time. Because otherwise, it just becomes garbage. Yeah. And then another piece that uh, you need to make sure there's a section that's required that says you will you understand you have to allow the secretary of HHS to audit your compliance program. You want to add a little phrase in there that says you can also audit it. Mm-hmm. That way, you can vet them. Yep. And this is where you'll get a lot of pushback. <laughs> well, you'll get a lot of pushback on anything <laughs> you put in there. Yeah. You know, when people ask, what things do you look for in a business associate agreement? I'm like, depends. Which side are you on? You downstream or upstream? Yeah. Well, my, my favorite part is when it's, you know, you're asking for, you know, business confidential information. I'm, I'm just asking about your program that you're doing, uh-huh. not yeah. super specific. Just what are you doing to make sure yeah. that you're doing these things? I love the ones where we send it out, you know, because ours are you know, often they're online and. We send it out and somebody responds in all caps so you know they're yelling. You know, and the question is, uh, there are many methods for performing a risk analysis. Which method do you use? And in all caps, if I told you this, it wouldn't be security. It's security. (laughs) Actually saw one of those and I'm like, wow. First of all, very concerned about your health. (laughs) Calm down. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. 
Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not that. And the method, seriously, what method you use? No. <laughs> People, you know, get snarky and all this other stuff. So what are you going to do? Yeah. Well, a lot of times it's because you're, you're asking them to prove something and they don't want to be questioned. Yeah. You should just trust yeah. me. Respect my thoughts. Yeah. High. yeah. <laughs> it, you know, it's like, are you saying, I don't know what I'm doing? No, I'm saying I got a document that you know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing, I'm. it's great. Just fill it out. Yeah. I hope but you know what you're doing. You, I know. <laughs> You know, the minute you start arguing, the minute you start yelling with all caps and all of that kind of stuff, I got to question what's going on because <laughs> this should this should be easy, mm -hmm. not hard. And, uh, you know, it, it's just crazy. I even had one guy said uh, we were vetting them and, and he said, well, I'm, I'm not answering these questions for you. I'll tell the client the answer to the questions, but I'm not telling you. I said, well, go ahead, because here's what's going to happen. You give them the answers, and they're going to give me the answers to help them evaluate them. So you can make the client spend more time, or you can just answer them. <laughs> Crickets. Mm. You know, I'm going to see it one way or another. You know, I and I'm allowed to see it legally. You know, I've signed all these agreements, and, I, you know, trust me. Just relax. <laughs> All, right. All right. So there we go. And and you can't take this stuff lightly anymore. No. I, I didn't, you know, I never had an opportunity to vet AMCA. But, you know, I'm sure that somewhere somebody said, we've been in business 30 years and we work with Quest and LabCorp. You know, so your little bitty company is nothing. We've got this handled. You don't have to worry about it. Mm-hmm. You know that came. Of course. Yeah. So there you have it. All right. That's all I that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> all right. So there you go. Now you know how to handle business associates. <laughs> so remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site. Rate us on our podcasting app or on iTunes or wherever else you listen to this uh, podcast. And remember for Donna and myself that HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims, the show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations. <laughs>